Have you ever noticed that some things in life just feel right? They do. They just feel right. And after you do it, you're like, that just felt right. That clicked. That makes sense. Felt good. The other day, I'm at the corner of Heathcote and Old Carolina. And I'm sitting there in my car, and I look over to my left-hand side. There's a guy on a Harley Davidson, a big old hog, right, sitting on my left-hand side. And he's stopped at the light, and I'm stopped at the light. So I look over there, and he's chilling, whatever, waiting for his green light. And then I look back away. And then I look back over there again, and his bike's on the ground. And they say that if you have a big Harley and that thing starts to fall, you might as well just go ahead and get out of the way because it's going down. <laughs> Those things are heavy. So his bike was on the ground, and then I noticed that he had grabbed his handlebars, and he was trying to pick it back up. And so I pulled my car into the median, and I jumped out of the car, and I ran over to him. And I said, are you okay? And he said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. You know, he was just couldn't get his bike up. So I grabbed the back seat, and I was pushing, and he was pushing. And we got that bike, got that hog back up, right? <laughs> and so he gets back on the bike, and he was an older guy. And I'm not a real spring chicken myself, but, you know, he was an older guy, so I'm young. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so he gets, he gets on his motorcycle, and I look at him, and I say, man, are you okay? And he looks at me, and he, he looks kind of flustered a little bit after what he had been through. And he said, uh, yeah, I'm okay. I'm good. You know? I said, great, man. I'm out of here. I'm gone. So I left, got in my car. And it was funny. When I got back in my car, I sat up in my seat, and I sat up a little bit taller in my, chair, in my, in my car. I cranked up my music just a little bit louder. My day got a little bit better. Everything just felt kind of good, you know, after doing that. And... I felt so good about it. I almost felt like a superhero without a cape. And as I was pulling up to the next intersection, I don't know why I thought this, and I'm not a morbid person, but I almost kind of wish that at the next intersection, somebody else fell over on their motorcycle. <laughs> because now I have experience, and I can, I can help people doing this. Here's the bottom line. The bottom line is when you help people, it just feels right. It just clicks. There's something about it that is right. Let me tell you why it feels good. Inside your programs, there's some notes there. Why don't you pull your notes out and, and look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 10. Here's what it says. It is God himself who has made us. That's a pretty amazing statement right there. God is the one that made you. In other words, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God. And because God made you, God's the one that gets to choose your job. He's the one that gets to choose your purpose in life. He's the one that decided what makes things click for you, what just feels right for you. He gets to choose that. And the thing that's amazing about it is this. When you read a portion of scripture like that, it makes sense that the Bible would say in Psalms that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It makes sense. Does it make any sense at all? Think about it logically. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God. I wouldn't have my next breath if it wasn't for God. I wouldn't have my next heartbeat if it wasn't for God. I wouldn't have my purpose or my job if it wasn't for God. So does it make any sense to turn around and say, there is no God? It makes no sense. It's the biggest cop-out in the history of earth to say that there is no God. Because there is a God. And he does give you a job. And he does give you purpose. Then it says, he makes you what we are. Don't ever be down on who you are. Don't ever be down on the way you look or the gifts that you have, or the abilities that you have, or the abilities that you don't have. Don't be down on that. You know why? Because God made you the way you are. And God doesn't make any junk. God made you just the way he wanted you to be to serve his purpose. And the Bible says he's given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And, he, and, and, and long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives doing what? Say it together. Helping others. You ever wonder why it just feels right when you help others? Because that's God's plan for your life before you were even thought of. Before you were even thought of, before you were ever born, God had already said, I want Barry White to make some great albums and some great music. <laughs> and then I want Barry White to also help other people. I want him to be helping people. And so every time you help people, it just clicks. It just feels right because that's what God always wanted us to do. God wants us to be contributors, not just consumers. He wants us to be giving with our lives. And every time you make a contribution with your life, it's going to feel right. 
That's why misers are miserable. And people that are generous are so stinking happy. That's why they're so happy all the time. That's why they're so kind to people. That's why they see good in everything, because they're generous. Why are you so happy? You know, it ticks you off after a while, you know, because people are so happy. They're happy because they're generous. Now, let me tell you this. There's a verse in the Bible that proves that God had a job picked out for you before you were born. And I want you to see that verse. It's in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. I don't think it's in the notes. For some reason, I forgot to put it in there. I don't know how that worked. But it is up on the screen, thanks to Eric. Here's the verse. It says, before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart for a special work. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, for Jeremiah, his job was a prophet to the nations. But here's the question. How are we different from Jeremiah? We're not at all different from Jeremiah. We're just like Jeremiah. God has chosen us before we are born. God has set us apart for a special work, even before we were born. So there's no difference between us and Jeremiah. Now, if we're not helping others in life, if we're not serving others, life's going to stink. Spend your life focused on yourself, and you'll live a stinky, horrible life. It's just the way it is. Spend your life helping other people and pouring yourself out in other people's lives, and you'll have an absolutely awesome, fulfilling life. Now, the only person that can serve is a servant, right? you got to be a servant to serve. So God has given us the task of being servants in a world and in a time and in a generation where, quite frankly, people look down on servants. You're just a servant. Oh, well, here are my servants. You know, what? people don't say that, but... The bottom line is we look down in a way when it comes to servants. And a lot of times I've heard pastors say before, you never hear people. So what is it that you want to do with life? Well, I'm hoping one day that I can achieve the level of servant. That's my goal in life. I want to be a servant. People don't go out with their business card and say, hey, let me give you my card. Barry White, servant. Just call me if you ever need anything. I'm a servant. I want to help you. People helper. That's what I do, you know. And, you know, people don't do that. As a matter of fact, go, do, go up to kids and say, what do you want to be when you grow up? How many kids are going to go, a servant? I want to be a servant when I grow up, just like my dad. He serves his family. He serves people in our community. He's amazing. My mom's incredible. She's a servant. I'm going to tell you, you don't hear that much. A lot of times you see the opposite. We give ourselves titles to make ourselves look great. I'm the chief executive you know, principal person. <laughs> you know, we put all these titles on our business card, and it makes us feel great. I remember when I graduated from college, I worked for a small company, and I was a salesman. That's what I was. But my business card said I was an account executive. It just kind of made me feel better, you know? When they gave me the cards, I'm like going, dude, I'm an executive right out of college. This is awesome, you know? <laughs> We want titles to make us feel better. All along, God wants us to be servants. He just wants us to serve people. Now, one of the things that you're going to find, especially in Scripture, is that God says that the most successful people in life are going to be servants. And as far as people are concerned in our society, success is determined by how many people serve you. But in God's economy, success is determined by how many people you serve. He just flips it all around. He totally flips around the norm. And the ones who are really successful in life are going to not scratch and claw their way to the top, but they're going to scratch and claw their way to the bottom. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 11. Look in your notes. This is what God says. He says, the person who is greatest among you will be your what? Will be your servant. That's straight from God. You want to be great in this world and be successful and be a servant. You ever notice how we talk about Jesus? He's the greatest, right? We always talk about Jesus Everything that he did was the greatest that you could ever possibly imagine. He was the greatest. Uh, he gave us the greatest sacrifice. He was the greatest teacher, the greatest miracle worker, the greatest leader, the greatest lover of people. He had the greatest compassion, the greatest authority. Let me ask you this. What makes Jesus so great? You know, aside from the fact that he was God in the flesh, which was a nice thing, you know, to be great, to achieve greatness. He wasn't just God in the flesh. He was a servant. 
So here is God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world, coming to this earth to say, I want to be a servant. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Jesus said this, For even I, the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give my life as a ransom for many. Our main function, you know what? Our main goal and function at our church is a very simple thing. Very simple. What are you doing at PVC? I'll tell you what we're doing. We are loving people to Jesus. Not loving them to death. <laughs> loving them to Jesus. All right? That's our goal beyond anything. One of the things I love about Disney World and Disneyland, the whole Disney organization, is they have a very simple mission statement. It's three words. Here it is. They base everything on these three words. Make people happy. If you're selling corn dogs at Disney World, when they get their corn dog, they better have a smile on their face. They better be the happiest person they've ever been because they got that corn dog from you. When they walk into a bathroom at Disney World, they better walk out going, that was the greatest bathroom I've ever experienced in my life. I think I'll go back in, <laughs> spend some more time in there. I'm happy because of that bathroom. How many bathrooms have made you really sad? Anybody been in a bathroom made you sad? Yeah, absolutely. So their goal is to make you happy. And literally everything that they do centers around making them happy. Guess what? At Park Valley Church, everything that we do centers around loving people to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the only person that will ever set anybody free. He's the only person that will ever change anybody's life that will last forever. Jesus is the way. And, and so that's what we do. Now, if you believe the Bible is true, Jesus came on the scene and made this declaration. And I always say this, don't shoot the messenger because this is Jesus Christ telling us this. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to God. No man gets into heaven except through me, Jesus. He's the only way. If we believe that, then we better love as many people to Jesus as we possibly can. Because there is a hell, and hell is real. And so what we ought to do is this. Rip down every wall, rip down every barrier that we possibly can that's standing in between a person and Jesus Christ. That's what we seek to do as a church. And somebody may come into this church and say, hey, I'm not down with that church. That church ain't like my old church. Well, you know why? Because we're trying to rip down every wall to Jesus. Whatever, who cares what anybody thinks? We're trying to bring people to Jesus, love people to Jesus. And that's why we do what we do. Because love is the most powerful thing that you can do. You're not going to argue somebody to Jesus. You're not going to wrestle some. Let's wrestle. And if I win, you get saved. You know? <laughs> Who, how's that going to happen? How are you going to fight somebody to Jesus? You will never win your enemies to Jesus. You will only be able to win your friends. So what's the goal? Make everybody your friend. Never have an enemy. And rip down every wall that you can to love people to Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 13, 3. If you give everything that you own to the poor, if you go to the stake to be born, burned as a martyr, but you don't have love, you're nowhere. No matter what you say, no matter what you believe, no matter what you do, you are bankrupt without love. I am bankrupt without love. Love is the most powerful thing and the most powerful way to influence anybody in life. Our big picture goal is to love people to Jesus. And the only way you can love them is to be a servant to them, to serve them. You say, why do you have to serve somebody to love them? Can't you just go up to them and say, I love you? Yeah, you can. But how many of you believe talk is cheap? Raise your hand. You believe talk is cheap? Yeah, absolutely. Talk is cheap. So how do you really say, I love you? You serve them. You love them by serving them. James chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Amazing verse of scripture. It says, I love this in the message paraphrase. It's like right in the face, right? Here's what it says. For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half starved, and you say, good morning, friend. Be clothed in Christ. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have to read it that way. And then it says, you walk out and walk off without even providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? 
Where does that get you? What does that benefit anybody? Verse 17, isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? Let me tell you one thing about our church. In the last month, we have had 39 new families visit our church. That's a lot of new families. That's a lot of people. And it's our goal to make sure that everybody comes into these doors and feels a little bit less creepy by visiting our church. Because if we were all honest, the first time you went to a church, it was just daggone creepy. It was. It's weird. You walk in and it's like you don't know anybody. You don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. It's creepy. You don't know anything. And so literally our goal at Park Valley Church is just to make our church less creepy. Because if we make it less creepy, we're tearing down a wall between somebody and Jesus. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of churches out there that are intentionally making themselves creepy. They're doing it on purpose. You want to shake them. Why are you doing that? How come you're mean to people when they come in? That's creepy. You don't want to do that. How come you're unprepared? How come you don't look at anybody and say hi and be kind to people? That's called creepy. Look, it's creepy enough without piling on. So that's the last thing that we want to do at our church is is pile on. We want to make this less and less creepy. It's unacceptable to make a church creepy because it's unacceptable to build a barrier between that person and Jesus Christ. So everything we do here is trying to draw people to Jesus. I told you the story about the people that went out in the parking lot for the 9 o'clock service. They put on the reflective vests. And you know what? We don't need to park a lot of cars. You know another thing I've learned? People don't like it when you tell them where to park. (laughs) Have you ever noticed that? We're like out there, all right, you, right in here. (laughs) And they drive by like, yeah, I'll park where I want to. <laughs> we learned that over at Alvi. We said, let's start a parking ministry. Everybody, everybody that came in for the first day said, they hate us. <laughs> they don't want us telling them, tell them where to park. Can we just scrap this ministry? So it's not necessarily so much about you in this spot. It's people with reflective vests going, hi, Welcome. And they put a smile on the person's face when they pull in. And you know what it does? It takes a little chip and it knocks a little block off of that barrier between them and Jesus. They know right away this is a friendly place. This is a place where they're going to like me. I want to go where they're kind. I want to go where they're going to like me. That's why we make people a, a fresh coffee. Why? Because we want them to find Jesus. That's why we teach children the Bible. Because we want them to find Jesus. That's, that's why we let them sit wherever they want to sit. And bring a donut and coffee into this place. Notice our carpet. We have carpet squares. If we have a stain, all we got to do is pull up that square and put a new one down. We have carpet squares for Jesus. (laughs) I'm not kidding you. Because we literally want to make this place a place where, hey, I can laugh. I feel accepted. I love Jesus. You know what? At the end of a service, somebody may actually bow their head and accept Christ as their Savior. Is that worth it? Is it worth carpet squares? Yeah, it is. Is it worth waving at somebody in the parking lot when it's a little chilly? Yeah, it is. It's worth it. It's that important. We don't dress up because we want them to find Jesus. We have trunk or treats because we want people to find Jesus. There's going to be close to 5,000 people that come onto this campus next weekend. And by the way, we need some help with that. Do we need trunks still? We need eight trunks. We need eight trunks. And basically a trunk is when you pull your... When we first started doing trunk or treat, we were saying, how many cars do you have? Bring all of your cars. <laughs> and we were just lining up everybody. Get all your cars in there, you know. We need people to, to have a trunk. And basically what you do is you park your car, open up your trunk, fill it with candy, and stand there and give it out to kids as they come by for free. And if you run out, we'll resupply you. Because we've already got a big inventory of candy that we're trying to get, that we can give out. We treat people with kindness because we want them to find Jesus. We're going to serve people. And the two principles that we hold on to when it comes to serving people are very simple. I'm going to go quickly because I have to. Here's the thing. We have to end this service early because we have a ministry fair when it's all over with. Do you remember our goal? This is info table. 
Our goal is to sign up how many new people when it comes to First Impression Ministries, Heart for the, Heart for the House Ministries in our church. How many are we supposed to sign up? Anybody remember? 100 people. How many did we get last night? Whew, we got a lot of work to do. We got 12 or 13 people signed out, and we're trying to get to 100. So I think this service could knock it out. Hopefully. Number one, when it comes to serving, we believe that sitting and soaking leads to stinking. <laughs> sitting and soaking leads to stinking. If you sit and all you do is soak, eventually you're going to stink. Like any sponge in any kitchen, you've got to wring it out. There's got to come a time in your life where instead of you going to, I go to seven Bible studies a week. That's great. Congratulations. There are some people that think the more Bible studies they go to, the more mature they are. No, listen to me. The more mature you are, the more you minister, the more you serve, the more you ring out, the more you pour yourself into somebody else. Because if all you do is suck in and suck in and suck in, you're going to, you're going to stink. It's just the way it is. John Maxwell says, we're educated far beyond our level of obedience. We don't obey half the stuff we know as it is. So if you'll start to serve people in this church, let me tell you what it will do. Serving people will fill you with life. It will fill you with life. It will invigorate you. Because impression without expression leads to depression. And we all need to be encouraged. And serving other people will do that. There's two big bodies of water in Israel. Number one is the Sea of Galilee. And it is filled with life. The reason it's filled with life is because it receives water. But it also lets water escape out of the, into the Jordan River. And as a result of it, it's filled with life. That flows down into another body of water. Do you know what it's called? The Dead Sea. Do you know why they call it the Dead Sea? Because nothing's living in it. All right? Nothing's alive in it. And I think it's also interesting that water flows into the Dead Sea, but it has nowhere for it to escape. It just sits there, and it just becomes stagnant. You know what? A lot of Christians are that way. We become stagnant. And we suck in and suck in and soak in. And we never ring out into anybody else's life. We never pour into anybody else's life. And as a result of it, we start to die and we start to stink, become stagnant in our lives. Romans 12, 5, so it is with Christ's body. We're all parts of his one body. And each of us has a different work to do. And since all of us are in the body of Christ, we belong to each other. And each of us needs all the others. What's that mean? I need you to serve me. You need me to serve you. We need each other. And when we do that, we come to life. Number two, use what God has given you now. Don't get upset because God gave that guy a gift that you want. I want that gift. Bag it. Who cares? I'm going to tell you, you are gifted. You have abilities. You are amazing. God has given you power. He's given you strength to serve him. He's given you wonderful abilities. So what do you do? Well, you start using them. Ephesians 5, 17, don't act thoughtlessly, but try to understand what the Lord wants you to do. You do four things, and I mean mega quick in one minute. First of all, you assess your gifts and abilities. And by the way, when you do an assessment, please do an honest assessment. How many of you think people think they're really good at stuff they're not really good at? Yeah. Have you ever seen a show called American Idol? Yeah, we all know that, don't we? Absolutely. We all sit back and they're singing and we're going, no. It's true. So you ask yourself some honest questions. Then the second thing you do is you ask somebody else some honest questions. And you preface it by saying, don't tell me what you know I want to hear. Tell me what I need to hear. Am I or am I not good in these areas? You're not good in those areas. I'm sorry. But you're really good in these areas. You rock in this area, you know. Because I guarantee you there's an area that you are absolutely good in. You also look for results. You also look where God confirms things. There are sometimes you don't have to ask anybody. People will come up to you and say, you were used of God. Let me just tell you that flat out. God used you in an amazing way. You know what that is? That's confirmation of a gift or an ability that God's given you. Number two, ask what it is that you enjoy doing. How many of you believe that God puts you exactly where you hate and you're miserable? Whatever you do, well, sometimes I guess he puts us in places. But, you know, the truth of the matter is, I honestly believe God is going to put you in an area where you have a passion and a heart and a desire. God's not going to stick you in a place that you hate, you know? 
I believe he'll do that. Number three, review your life experience. God never wastes an experience in your life. You look back on your life and you say, wow, I've been through this and this and it's been hard and I don't know why. Listen, God never wasted a minute of that. You shouldn't waste it either. Allow it to shape you and mold you into the person that God wants you to be so that you can use that to serve him. And, and number four, or letter D, start today. Don't wait until you do a spiritual gift analysis test. Well, my spiritual gift analysis test says that, you know, that's good, whatever. Let me tell you the best analysis you'll ever do. Just try stuff. Just do stuff. I guarantee you, There are things that you're good at you don't even know you're good at yet because you never tried it. And you need to get out there and start serving God. And maybe you'll find two or three things that you're not good at and that aren't fulfilling and that you're not passionate about. But maybe you'll find some things that you are good at. So we've given you all kinds of opportunities to serve. Again, I picked up this one. Oh, hey, inside your programs, there's a little flyer. Pull it out. It's got a bunch of little circles on top with uh, graphics on them. Is there one handy that I could grab? Wendy could... Hook me up. I'm sorry, Wendy. Now, she doesn't have one. It should be that one right there. Yes, thank you. It's got little, uh, this right here means nursery, the little uh, diaper pin. And they go with the colors of the list down below. Preschool is the yellow. Elementary is the bicycle. I love the security one. It's handcuffs. That's kind of cool, you know. Um, The uh, check-in is the barcode there. The refreshments is the cup of coffee. So you can go through and see uh, the different things. Listen, we need an army of people to get a heart for the house. We need an army of people that are going to take part in this church to tear down barriers and tear down walls between the people of Haymarket and Gainesville and Jesus Christ, the only one that can ever change their lives. Now, we expect everyone to serve in some way, shape, or form. We expect everyone to try something. You're like, this is my first time. You're not exempt. You have to get a job anyway. Even if you're a first-time visitor, I'm sorry. (laughs) Don't leave here without signing up for coffee or something. Next week, you're on coffee duty or whatever. Hey, you might as well jump in, but we don't even know if we want to go to this church yet. Don't waste your time. Just come to this church. (laughs) Just commit. But we need you to sign up and sign up today. Don't waste another minute. You say, well, I can't go to your ministry fair. Okay, that's fine. That's why we have these buckets, all right? If you want to help us in security, handcuffs, then fill out your form, come up here, and just drop it in the bucket. But we would like for, mo- we would like for you to go through these doors and go to our ministry fair and take time to talk to one of the ministry leaders because we believe if you talk to someone, there's a greater percentage of chance that you'll get connected to that ministry and do something with it. We need your help. And you need to feel alive. And you won't feel alive without serving. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute? The greatest decision you'll ever make with your life is to accept Jesus as your Savior. And if you've never done that, now's the time. Why don't you pray something like this? Dear Heavenly Father, I give you my life. And I want you to know that I believe. I believe in Jesus Christ. And I receive him as my Lord and my Savior. Please forgive me for my sin. Come into my heart and be my Savior today. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, as we close this service, I pray that we would get an amazing number of people that sign up for a ministry, that help us, that join us in the task of tearing down barriers between these communities, this community and Jesus Christ. It's that important. It's that big. It's a kingdom perspective. It's loving people to Jesus. We can't waste another minute. Not after what you did for us on a cross 2,000 years ago. We don't have a right to waste our lives. Help us, Lord, to understand what's important. Help us to value the things that are important. God, we love you. It's an honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.